So we just uh, began the novel, uh, Joyce's A Portrait, and we were actually on uh, page 7, uh, the second page of the novel, uh, chapter 1. So at the end of chapter, uh, at the end of page 7, uh, just after the uh, Hanses are mentioned, and Eileen Hans is mentioned, uh, then Dante says, O oh, Stephen will apologize. And there is a called nursery rhyme, uh, Oh, if not, the eagles will come and pull out his eyes. Pull out his eyes, apologize, apologize, pull out his eyes, and so on. So uh, the function of this uh, rhyme at the very beginning of the novel is to introduce the idea of confession and apology, an idea which is associated with the uh, Roman Catholic practice of confession and in general the uh, strict uh, imposition of discipline and punishment uh, in the uh, school run by the Jesuit order. Uh, apart from that, this rhyme also introduces uh, or alludes to the myth of Prometheus. As you all know that uh, Prometheus was chained to a rock uh, as a punishment for bringing fire to man. Uh, punishment meted out by Zeus and an eagle would come every day and uh, peek at his liver. So here the eagle coming and pulling out the eyes is an allusion to the Prometheus myth uh, and, the Prometh and Prometheus is looked upon as a symbol for uh, the rebel or the artist and therefore uh, it is in uh, concerns with the uh, attempt in this novel to uh, create the myth of the artist as a rebel figure in society. So uh, Stephen's parents uh, leave him at uh, Plumbois Wood College, the Jesuit run school, and a uh, realistic description uh, of uh, the boys uh, and the uh, plays or uh, games uh, organized on the field in which everybody ha has to participate. All these are here. Then on uh, page 11 of my edition, uh, there is a reference to uh, Father Arnold uh, teaching mathematics and uh, Father Arnold divides the class into two groups and names them Lancaster and York and therefore assigns the symbol of these two uh, parties uh, in the uh, civil war as uh, the, that of white rose and red rose. So uh, the father says, right, bravo Lancaster, the red rose wins, come on now, York, forge ahead. Now Stephen isn't much interested in this competition and he's also not very good in mathematics. But he is interested in the uh, you know color symbolism or the use of color red and white and also the rose image. So as he sees other boys getting the prize, uh, his white silk badge fluttered and fluttered as he walked at the next sum and heard Father Arnold's voice. Then all his eagerness passed away and he felt his face quite cool. He thought his face must be white because it felt so cool. He could not get out the answer for this sum, but it did not matter. So Stephen is associating uh, the color white with the uh, old sensation. So in his uh, mind he is associating a visual image uh, or a visual experience with a tactile experience uh, and this is what we see Stephen uh, constantly doing in this novel and this is something which uh, artists often do uh, that is 
the different sensations are combined in the mind of the artist to create a composite experience and uh, Coleridge had theorized it as synesthesia. In Greek, uh, syn means together, aesthesis means perception. So perception of all the you know, sensations together, that is synesthesia. And uh, Joyce uses many synesthetic images in the novel uh, because uh, his hero is a budding artist. White roses and red roses, those were beautiful colors to think of. And the cards for first place and second place and third place were beautiful colors too. Pink and cream and lavender. Lavender and cream and pink roses were beautiful to think of. So Stephen is uh, interested in the colors and uh, the beauty of the colorful roses. So as I already told you that uh, the rose symbol is an important symbol in this novel. It stands for the development of the psyche of the hero. Perhaps a wild rose might be like those colors and he remembered the song about the wild rose blossoms on the little green place. But you could not have a green rose, but perhaps somewhere in the world you could. Thus, uh, Stephen is capable of imagining things which are not there in the world. So a green rose is something which is, uh, which can only be imagined, but not, it cannot be found in the world. The boys uh, tease him, as uh, often happens in uh, school hostels, and uh, a boy named Wells asks him, Tell us, Dedalus, do you kiss your mother before you go to bed? Stephen answered, I do. Wells turned to the other fellows and said, Oh, I say, here is a fellow who says he kisses his mother every night before he goes to bed. The other fellows stopped their game and turned round laughing. Stephen blushed under their eyes and said, I do not. Well said, Oh, I say, here is a fellow says he doesn't kiss his mother before he goes to bed. They all laughed again. Stephen tried to laugh with them. He felt his whole body hot and confused in a moment. What was the right answer to the question? He had given two and still Wells laughed. But Wells must know the right answer for he was in third of grammar. So here we see that uh, an allusion to the uh, Oedipus complex. Uh, the senior boy uh, teases Stephen uh, about him kissing his mother uh, and Stephen tries both answers but the boys laugh all the same. Uh, therefore Stephen isn't aware about the uh, significance of these answers. So for him it is an innocent thing, uh, kissing his mother before going to bed at night. But these senior boys, they have uh, some other interpretation of this as uh, an expression of limit over desire. And thus we see that this idea of uh, libido, the idea of uh, desire, the universe complex, all these are introduced at the very beginning because uh, these, these uh, uh, drives can be seen in a child uh, at a very young age, according to Freud. There was a picture of the earth on the first page of his geography, a big ball in the middle of clouds, flaming had a box of crayons and one night during free study he had colored the earth green and the clouds maroon. That was like the two brushes in Dante's press, the brush with the green velvet back for Parnell and the brush with the maroon velvet back for Michael David. Now I already told you about the color symbolism uh, of uh, these two colors which stand for the two different parties in Ireland at the time. And uh, therefore, Stephen, uh, when he looks at the uh, way uh, flaming colors the picture with uh, maroon and uh, uh, green, then uh, he thinks of the two colors of Dante's brushes. Thus, the color symbolism uh, which may be, uh, colors may be used uh, 
with uh, different purposes in mind. Uh, they may be used for simply coloring something, uh, but they also may stand for uh, symbolism and may have some political significance. So here we uh, see that the psyche of the young Stephen, very young, very little boy, uh, is represented uh, in a way that the child is confused about things in this world. So he tries to find his place in this world. And he writes on uh, his on the pilot of his geography book, Stephen Dedalus, class of elements, Clonboys would call it, Salins, County Kildare, Ireland, you know, the world, the universe. So nobody but a child would think like this uh, in uh, about his uh, position, about his uh, situation. Stephen Dedalus is my name, Ireland is my nation, Congress is my dwelling place, and heaven my expectation. So thus, uh, it is a way of Stephen coming to uh, terms with uh, the world. A little below we see, uh, he wondered which was right. That is, uh, the first paragraph uh, when he thinks about God, uh, that is, his early, uh, you know, deliberation over God uh, in a child's way, in a confused manner. The next paragraph is about politics. It made him very tired to think that way. It made him feel his head very big. He turned over the flyleaf and looked where he had the green round earth in the middle of the Merun house. He wondered which was right to be for the green or uh, for the maroon, because Dante had ripped the green velvet back off the brush that was for Parnell one day with the scissors and had told him that Parnell was a bad man. So uh, the uh, political antagonism of Dante against Parnell and this violent act of ripping off the uh, green back of the brush and uh, she also tried to prejudice the child Stephen by saying that Parnell was a bad man. He wondered if they were arguing at home about that. That was called politics. So for him politics meant arguing about something which he did not understand. There were two sides in it. Dante was on one side and his father and Mr. Casey were on the other side, but his mother and Uncle Charles were on no side. Every day there was something in the paper about it. Thus, the constant quarrels at home uh, found uh, resonance in the uh, newspapers where this politics, uh, news about this political fight uh, would find a place. So at home Stephen found that people were divided into groups. But there were also uh, his mother and Abu Charles, who appeared to be neutral, who uh, did not participate so much in political discussion. Uh, this uh, political conflict and the impact of this on Stephen's form uh, will be uh, graphically rendered in the description of the Christmas dinner, uh, which follows uh, in this chapter. Bell rings for prayer, all the uh, you know rituals, the paraphernalia of Roman Catholic you know uh, discipline uh, are described here. Uh, one or two pages later, we see that Stephen is sick uh, because uh, he was thrown into a ditch uh, by a senior boy uh, called uh, Wells, and he develops fever. And naturally, when he is alone in hostel uh, with fever, he uh, feels nostalgic and he wants to go home. He crouched down between the sheets, glad of their tepid glow. He heard the fellows talk among themselves about him at, uh, as they dressed for mass. It was a mean thing to do, to shoulder him into the square ditch, they were saying. Then their voices ceased. They had gone. A voice at his bed said, Dedalus, don't spy on us. Sure you won't. Wells's face was there. He looked at it and saw that Wells was afraid. So the boy who had thrown Stephen into the ditch 
Wells, uh, he asks him whether he would complain to the uh, authorities. I didn't mean to, surely won't. His father had told him whatever he did, never to please John Fellow. He shook his head and answered no and felt glad. So, uh, Stephen's father told him that you should never complain against any of your friends. And therefore Stephen told him that uh, he will not complain against him. And obviously the boy was afraid. Then uh, he writes home, Dear mother, I am sick. I want to go home. Please come and take me home. I am in the infirmary. Your fond son, Stephen. And he felt left out. He felt neglected. His parents were far uh, from him. I uh, skip to three pages and come to page 24 of my edition, uh, where uh, the first dream of Stephen is described. Now, dreams are important in this novel and they are often used to, uh, uh, you know, express the uh, subconscious or the unconscious of the character uh, following Freud. So, uh, Stephen sees in his dream <coughs> A tall man stood on the deck looking out towards the flat dark land and by the light of the clear head he saw his face, the sorrowful face of brother Michael. He saw him lift his hand towards the people and heard him say in a loud voice of sorrow over the waters, He is dead. We saw him lying open, lying upon the catapult. Now brother Michael is a brother in that, you know, school. But obviously uh, he had nothing to do with uh, Parnell's death. But as in dreams, everything gets mixed up. So here, Stephen sees brother Michael talking about Parnell being dead. A wail of sorrow went up from the people. Parnell, Parnell, he is dead. They fell upon their knees, mourning in sorrow. And he saw Dante in a maroon velvet dress and with a green velvet mantle hanging from her shoulders, walking proudly and silently past the people who knelt by the water sketch. So, in the dream everything gets mixed up, but we can see that uh, the anxiety of this uh, bitter quarrel between the two political uh, parties and uh, the way his family is also divided on this issue, that anxiety finds an expression uh, through this dream. Therefore, obviously, with the assassination of Parnell uh, had a great impact uh, upon the people uh, and even the child like Stephen, uh, you know, was not uh, scared, scared because uh, his father was a follower of Parnell and therefore uh, the assassination of Parnell uh, meant that the uh, society was further divided or bitterly divided on the issue of politics. Then uh, comes the uh, description of the uh, Christmas dinner, which goes on for a few pages. And uh, this description is important uh, because it is primarily, it is an example of uh, Joyce's use of the realistic style and his use of dialogue. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, the great fire is made during Christmas. All were waiting, and uh, Mr. Casey, uh, Stephen's father's friend, he was also there. And then they have a conversation. And Stephen's father, we know, was a jovial character, and uh, he wants to enjoy his dinner. He wants also everybody to enjoy their dinner. But unfortunately, just the opposite happens. Mm -hmm. Stephen's father, Mr. Dedalus, calls uh, Dante Mrs. Riordan. That is, uh, he addresses her formally. Uh, now Mrs. Riordan sit over, John sit you down, my hearty. He looked round to where Uncle Charles sat and said, Now then, sir, there is a bird here waiting for you. 
So farming the turkey at Christmas dinner was, uh, you know, a common ritual, and they would uh, want to enjoy the turkey, and uh, the head of the family usually carves the turkey, and the uh, postman's father does that and uh, places the large pieces on everybody's plate. Uh, for Stephen, it was his first Christmas dinner and he thought of his little brothers and sisters who were waiting in the nursery as he had often waited till the pudding came. So children who were too small, they of course did not participate in the dinner, but they were confined to the nursery and at the end of the dinner they were given the pudding. But now Stephen has grown a little older, so for the first time he is participating in the Christmas dinner. So there is this conversation going on between uh, Mr. Casey and uh, Mr. Dedalus. I didn't think he had that much in him, said Mr. Casey. So uh, they are talking about somebody who had uh, said that uh, the, uh, who had said to a priest, that the priests should not intervene in politics so much. I will pay you your dues, Father, when you cease turning the house of God into a polling booth. So, this is how that man protested against the, you know, meddling of the priests in politics. A nice answer, said Dante, for any man calling himself a Catholic to give to his priest. So Dante is being sarcastic. She is very bitter with this criticism of the priest. They have only themselves to blame, said Mr. Dedalus slowly. If they took a fool's advice, they would confine their attention to religion. So religion and uh, politics should not be mixed. If they are mixed, then there is always danger, or there is a danger that the fabric of society might be, you know, divided, might be, might, might be torn, might fall apart. It is religion, Dante said. They are doing their duty in warning the people. So Dante says that the priest should uh, participate in religion, in politics, because they are the leaders of the people, and therefore they should warn the people about any bad politics or any harmful politics. Now, we know that historically Roman Catholicism uh, always participated in politics and always tried to dominate uh, the government and uh, even after the Reformation, the Puritans, we know, they also uh, propounded theories of uh, political state governed by priests or uh, they equated religion with the state. Therefore, this was nothing uncommon in history. But in some societies, religion dominates politics, not in every society. So in those societies which, where religion dominates politics, uh, there is usually a lot of fighting, a lot of, you know, criminal riots and so on. We go to the house of God, Mr. Casey said, in all humility to pray to our Maker and not to hear election addresses. It is religion, Dante said again, they are right, they must direct their thoughts. So, Dante just represents one, you know, view of religion that uh, religious leaders should also guide people in political matters. And Mr. Dedalus is distinguishing the realms of politics and religion as separate. Now, we know that Today in many societies, or in most societies we may say, uh, religion has been separated from politics. 
and uh, the idea of some kind of secularism of the state or the government uh, has been uh, established. But it was not always the case or even today in some societies it is not the case. Uh, the reason is that in any country the community will be divided in religion. But the responsibility of the government uh, or the state is to look after all members of the country, not only those of one particular religion. Therefore, uh, the modern idea is that states should be secular in their views. And preach politics from the altar, is it? asked Mr. Dedalus. Certainly, said Dante, it is a question of public morality. A priest would not be a priest if he did not tell his flock what is right and what is wrong. So we see that actually this debate uh, cannot be resolved by discussion or argument. So the more they argue over it, the argument becomes heated and uh, more and more they become angry. For pity's sake and for pity's sake, let us have no political discussion on this day of all days in the year, Stephen's mother says. So this is uh, the day of Christmas, it's Christmas evening and uh, people want to enjoy their Christmas dinner. Therefore, she appeals that no political discussion should be held. Quite right, ma'am, said Uncle Charles. Now, Simon, that is quite enough now, not another word now. So Uncle Charles and uh, Mrs. Dedalus, they try to stop the argument, but we will see that it is in vain. So uh, Dante will not stop, and she goes on uh, saying bitterly, nice language for any Catholic we use, and so on. And am I to sit here and listen to the pastors of my church being clouded? Nobody is saying a word against them, said Mr. Dedalus, so long as they don't meddle in politics. The bishops and priests of Ireland have spoken, said Dante, and they must be obeyed. So, uh, then Mr. Casey is exasperated and says, the bishop, uh, let them have politics alone, said Mr. Casey, or the people may leave their church alone. That is, uh, if the priests do not confine their activities to religion, uh, but meddle in politics, then people will not be interested in their religion anymore. Now this is a statement which is blasphemous uh, because it is directly opposed to religion uh, which in a country uh, deeply religious minded at the time uh, it was uh, difficult to accept. So Dante immediately says, you hear? And uh, Mr. Casey, Simon, said Mrs. Dedalus, let it end now. Too bad, too bad, said Uncle Charles. What, cried Mr. Dedalus, were you to desert him at the bidding of the English people? That is, uh, Parnell was our leader, we could not desert him. We are all sinners. Uh, he was no longer worthy to lead, said Dante. He was a public sinner. So Dante is alluding to the uh, love affair of Parnell with... Uh, widow, uh, which the uh, Catholic Church had made a matter of gossip. We are all sinners and black sinners, said Mr. Casey Coleman. And then Dante uh, quotes from the Bible and says that uh, when such scandal happens, then a millstone uh, should be tied to the neck and he should be cast into depth of the sea. Uh, so these lines are from the Bible, that is the language of the Holy Ghost. And very bad language if you ask me, said Mr. Dedalus, coolly. So the language of the Old Testament cannot be appropriate for, uh, you know, uh, modern times, and particularly the uh, approach of Old Testament uh, the uh, idea of revenge or the idea of punishment, uh, the harsh qualities of the old religion were uh, replaced by the idea of mercy, charity and love. 
of Christ uh, in the New Testament. And therefore, what Dante quotes uh, is not very, you know, appropriate. So, but even then, it is quoted from the Bible and therefore saying that it is bad language is a kind of blasphemy. And therefore, Uncle Charles tries to warn uh, Dedalus, uh, Mr. Dedalus, that he is setting a bad example before his son, uh, who is a small child. Simon, Simon, the boy. Yes, yes, said Mr. Dedalus. I went about, I was thinking about the bad language of that railway porter. So now Mr. Dedalus tries to give a different interpretation. So the dinner continues, but uh, argument does not stop. Uh, when uh, Mr. Dedalus carves a large piece from the turkey and uh, puts it on uh, the dish, he says, there is a tasty bit here we call the Pope's nose, if any lady or gentleman. So in this allusion to the piece of turkey as Pope's nose also we see, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, laughing at the, the Roman Catholic practices, the ridicule of the Roman Catholic practices. So nobody wants to eat, everybody has lost the appetite because of this uh, debate. And then Mr. Dedalus threw his knife and fork noisily on his plate. The aspect, he said, is it for BD with the leaf? or put the tub of guts up in Armagh, respect. Then how can one respect these, you know, fat monks? Uh, and uh, Dante says, they are the Lord's anointed, they are an honor to their country. Tub of guts, said Mr. Dedalus coarsely. He has a handsome face, mind you, in repose. Uh, you should see them, you should see that fellow lapping up his bacon and cabbage on a cold winter's day. So these priests, they are greedy, they eat too much, uh, therefore people cannot have any respect for them. Really, Simon said, Mrs. Dedalus, you should not speak that way before Stephen. It is not right. Oh, you will remember all this when he grows up, said Dante hotly. The language he heard against God and religion and priests in his own home. So Dante says that the blasphemous way in which his father uh, and his father's friend, they all speak that will create a deep impression on Stephen's mind and therefore he will not develop any respect for religion. And actually we see that happening as Stephen grows up. Initially he had some fascination for religion but gradually he comes to hate uh, some aspects of religion. Let him remember too, cried Mr. Casey to her from across the table, the language which is the priest and the priest pawns broke Cornell's heart and hounded him into his grave. Let him remember that too when he grows up. Sons of bitches, cried Mr. Dedalus, when he was down they turned on him to betray him and rend him like rats in the sewer. No leaf dogs, uh, and they look it, by Christ they look it. They behave rightly, cried Dante, they obeyed their bishops and their priests, honored to them. So we see that uh, they fight bitterly uh, over uh, politics and John Casey telling a story. Now this story was also uh, about a bitter, you know, and testless uh, event uh, when a man was having a quarrel with a woman over religion, then the man spit into the woman's eyes the tobacco that he was chewing. And uh, Casey tells this story. But before he tells this story, we see that Stephen is thinking about something else. He is wondering why Mr. Casey is against the priests. But why was he then against the priests? Because Dante must be right then, but he had heard his father say that she was a spoiled nun and that she had come out of the convent in the Aleganese when her brother had got the money from the savages for the trinkets and the chainies. So, an old scandal and uh, 
the fact that Dante uh, was earlier a nun, but then he uh, came out of the cloister and uh, therefore uh, then she came out of the cloister and she may be considered as a failed nun. And that is an explanation why she is so bitter, because she is not successful in her religious life or religious career and therefore uh, at home also she is not at peace with anybody. So Stephen is wondering uh, who is right, whether Dante is right or Mr. Casey and his father. Perhaps that made her severe against Cornell and she did not like him to play with Eileen because Eileen was a Protestant and when she was young she knew children that used to play with Protestants and the Protestants used to make fun of the litany of the blessed virgin. Tower of ivory they used to say, house of gold. So Stephen wondered, uh, what could this phrase mean? Tower of ivory, house of gold, uh, praise of Virgin Mary. But when he looks at Eileen's uh, long thin white arms, hands, then he thinks that yes, this is actually the description of Tower of Ivory. How could a woman be a Tower of Ivory or a House of Gold? Who was like them? And he remembered the evening in the infirmary in Plongoes, the dark waters, the light at the fire head, and the moan of sorrow from the people when they had so the uh, allusion to Parnell's death. Irene had long white hands. One evening when playing pig, she had put her hands over his eyes long and white and thin and cold and soft. So you see that uh, Stephen uh, is always attracted by the different, uh, you know, sensu sensations, the different stimuli and uh, tactile stimuli, cold and, uh, you know, thin, uh, shape, long, color, white, so tactile, visual and so on. That was the meaning of towering, Tower of Ivory. So Ivory is a cold white thing. Therefore, even though there is this bitter, you know, political argument going on, Stephen in his mind uh, digresses and thinks about Eileen and uh, we see that he is attracted by the, uh, by color, by sensation, and so on by beauty of uh, Eileen's hands. Then uh, Casey, told, uh, Casey uh, tells the story of uh, the man spitting on the eyes of the woman when they had a bitter quarrel and Dante, uh, Mrs. Gadolus laughed loudly and lay back in his chair while Uncle Charles swayed his head to and fro. Uh, that is in disapproval that this kind of story should not be told. Dante looked terribly angry and repeated while they laughed. Very nice, huh? Very nice. It was not nice about the spit in the woman's eye, but what was the name the woman had called Kitty Oshia that Mr. Casey would not repeat? So the woman had called a name uh, to uh, uh, an Irish leader, a political leader. He thought of Mr. Casey walking through the crowds of people and making speeches from a governor. So Casey was a political activist and that night Mr. Casey had not gone to Dublin by train but a car had come to the door and he had heard his father say something about the uh, cabin to the road. He was for Ireland and Cornell and so was his father and so was Dante too for one night at the band on the Esplanade. She had hit a gentleman on the head with her umbrella because he had taken off his hat when the band played God Save the Queen at the end. So Dante was also for Ireland. Uh, she was also patriotic because she was against the English. And Mr. Casey and Mr. Dedalus, they were also patriotic. They were also against the English. So Stephen doesn't understand. Why do they fight among themselves? Ah, John, he said, it is true for them, we are an unfortunate priest-ridden race and always were and always will be till the end of the chapter. 
So uh, this uh, creates a strong impression upon Stephen and throughout the novel we see that uh, Stephen uh, engages with this uh, love-hate relationship with the church and the priests. So the point of view that Ireland is a priest-ridden race, that is the priests meddle too much in uh, politics and the uh, actual influence of the priests over people in Ireland was enormous. As we see in the bringing up of Stephen, he is brought up in Jesuit run schools, he is uh, taught all the you know, religious rituals and uh, practices and brought up in a very religious manner uh, so that when he grows up a little, he even has the ambition of becoming a priest one day. Therefore Stephen has a love and red, hate relationship with the church. Dante broke in angrily. If you are a priest ridden race, you ought to be proud of it. They are the apple of God's eye. Touch them not, says Christ, for they are the apple of my eye. And can we not love our country then? asked Mr. Casey. Are we not to follow the man that was born to lead us? That is Cornell. A traitor to his country, replied Dante. A traitor and adulterer. The priests were right to abandon him. The priests were always the true friends of Ireland. Were they faith? said Mr. Casey. He threw his fist on the table and frowning angrily protruded one finger after another. Didn't the bishops of Ireland betray us in the time of the Union? when Bishop Lanigan presented an address of loyalty to the Marquess Cornwallis. That is, the uh, bishops entered into an understanding with the English government. Didn't the bishops and priests sell the aspirations of their country in 1829 in return for Catholic emancipation? Didn't they denounce the Fenian movement from the pulpit and in the confession box? And didn't they dishonor the ashes of Terence Gero MacManus? So, Casey uh, rattles out the history of uh, politics uh, and the independence movement in Ireland where the uh, bishops had uh, you know, important position and probably the British tried to divide the people of the Ireland on the basis of religion as they did here in India and uh, the Irish people were uh, divided uh, among themselves. His face was glowing with anger and Stephen felt that though rise to his own cheek as the spoken words thrilled him. Mr. Dedalus uttered a gulf of coarse call. Oh by God, he cried, I forgot little old Paul Cullen, another apple of God's eye. There is another priest. Dante went across the table and cried to Mr. Casey, right, right, they were always right. God and morality and religion come first. Mrs. Dedalus tries to stop Dante. Mr. Casey raised his clenched fist and brought it down on the table with a crash. Very well then, he shouted hoarsely. If it comes to that, no God for Ireland. So that is absolute blasphemy, uh, which should not be, uh, you know, said before the little boy. No God for Ireland, he cried. We have had too much God in Ireland. Away with God. Blasphema, devil, screamed Dante, starting to her feet and almost spitting in his face. Uncle Charles and Mr. Dedalus pulled Mr. Casey back into his chair again, talking to him from both sides reasonably. He started, uh, he stared before him out of his dark flaming eyes, repeating, away with God, I say. Thus we see this uh, violent scene, you know, taking place before Stephen's eyes. Stephen raising his terror-stricken face saw that his father's eyes were full of tears. So, as Mr. Casey laments over Parnell's death, poor Parnell, he cried loudly, my dead king. He sobbed loudly and bitterly. So, Casey was crying loudly and Stephen saw that his father was also weeping, uh, tears coming down uh, his eyes. Uh, and uh, this is, this may be uh, interpreted by, according to psychoanalysis, that uh, the father weeping uh, stands for 
the breaking down or the collapse of the father figure or paternal threat. So in the mind of the child, uh, father uh, represents a threat. He stands for discipline, he stands for punishment. So as uh, Lacan, after Freud, Lacan had uh, termed it the uh, name of the father. And uh, father therefore stands for uh, law, stands for punishment and threat to the child. And according to Freud, uh, because of the Oedipus complex, a child always feels his father to be his rival uh, in his love to his mother. So therefore, the father uh, figure uh, is a paternal threat. And uh, at one point in life, according to Freud, when the child grows up, then at one point the paternal threat must collapse. And it is then that the full uh, personality of the child may develop. Uh, two pages later, again, uh, Stephen is thinking of Eileen. Eileen had long, thin, cool white hands too, because she was a girl. They were like ivory, only soft. That was the meaning of power of ivory, but Protestants could not understand it and made fun of it. So we see that uh, Stephen finds Roman Catholicism attractive uh, in its appreciation of art and appreciation of beauty. Uh, Protestants, on the other hand, we know they were, or particularly the Puritans among the Protestants, they were against idols and uh, during the Reformation, Puritans had destroyed many idols and many beautiful works of art. But in Roman Catholic churches, idols and uh, paintings, uh, they were always there, they were appreciated. Uh, the bishops and popes, they commissioned the artists for, you know, uh, making artworks. And uh, in uh, Roman Catholic churches, one would find beautiful idols of Virgin Mary with infant uh, Jesus and so on. So this aspect of Roman Catholicism, uh, insofar as it uh, appreciates art, it patronizes art, that Stephen found attractive. But uh, the other aspect, that is regimentation, discipline, and so on, that aspect he found uh, confining, he found uh, that he could not accept that because he was of an artistic temperament and artists uh, cannot uh, accept such boundaries or such strict rules. Well, so after this uh, there is the description of uh, Stephen being physically punished unjustly by a father. And uh, Stephen protests against it and complains to the rector. And with that, the chapter ends. So, uh, the idea of corporeal punishment, its impact on a child, and uh, thus this crisis that is created here, that Stephen is unjustly punished. How he will deal with this crisis? So it is uh, not common for a young child to dare uh, to have the courage to go to the rector and complain against the father. Uh, but ultimately Stephen does that and then he becomes a hero in the eyes of his uh, friends, uh, which uh, would mean uh, development in Stephen's personality. So uh, we will look at these aspects in the next class and, and we will finish the chapter. So I will stop here. If you have any questions, you can ask. No, sir. It's all. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir.